And it gets your face like warmed up. Super serious. For nothing fun or funny ever, 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 ever happens. This is a super serious thing. I don't even like dogs. Super serious. Haha. Hello, everybody. We're actually recording in the morning for the first time ever. So uh, if we sound like we have our morning voices going, that's because we do. Yeah. <laughs> These are some of the first words I've said today. <laughs> um, so good morning, good afternoon, where whatever it is, whatever time of day it is for you while you're listening. I hope you're having a good one. Um, so uh, this is a super serious dog podcast. I'm Misha. That's Courtney. You guys hopefully know that by now. <laughs> and uh, today we're going to talk about what is the canine good citizen test. The CGC. Uh, CGC. Um, some of you may already know this. So if you do um, stick around because you may hear some funny anecdotes, but otherwise you could just move on. Um. <laughs> we give you permission. If you know all about the CGC, like, Maybe don't listen to this episode. Maybe send it to a friend <laughs> that doesn't know, you know, share, share the good stuff. Yeah. So, Courtney, how would you like briefly summarize the CGC test? Um, so I think it's a it's a good framework for anyone to aim for just for things to be able to do with your dog uh, goal. It's a good good goals to have, even if you never take it or you never pass it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um it's basically a test over 10 skill sets that come in handy in uh, having your dog as a member of society. Yep. So it's canine good citizen because they it's, it's put together by the AKC. So the American kennel club, and um, it's essentially items that if your dog can do this, they're fit to be in public basically or whatever. Right. Um, but like Courtney said, it is definitely some great goals that you can aim for, especially if like, you want to have that perfect dog. That's awesome. When you take them to breweries and go to coffee shops and do stuff like that. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's just, it's nice to have standards and goals and really specific things to, to work on. Yes. Um, the nice thing is the test is actually pretty open-ended. Um, so there's a lot of like, there is some room for interpretation for whoever does the test issues, the test. However, they can't be too nitpicky either, which is kind of great. So <clears throat> what I figured we'd do is we would go through each of the test items and kind of talk about them. And, um, and then maybe at the, with, as we, as we talk about each item, we'll kind of talk about how you can work on that essentially, yeah. how you can practice it. Um, Cause a lot of it's really easy. It might be stuff that you're already doing, but you can just like practice find, it with a purpose. It a little bit. Yeah. Practice yeah. with purpose is always a good thing. Yeah, because whenever I practice and I don't have like a reason for it, I'm I'm like super scatterbrained. I'll work on three different things. I won't focus as well on the one thing. It'll it's it's a lot easier when I'm like, cool, this dog needs to be able to hold it down in a very specific environment or in a specific way or whatever. Then it helps me to stay more focused. <laughs> That yeah. ADD. Yeah, anything that can help help you, her brain stay focused is always good. <laughs> okay, so what is the first thing on the test? Okay, so like Courtney said, there's 10 items. So the very first one is called greeting a friendly stranger. So I'm not going to read out the specifics. You can go search Canine Good Citizen and see like all the nuances and the of the specific rules for each thing. But effectively, it's you walk up to somebody else, you exchange brief pleasantries, and then you keep on walking. There's no dog involved or anything like that for this por portion of the test. It's literally just me and my dog and Courtney pass each other in public and go, hey, how's it going? How have you been? What vaccine did you get? Okay, see you later. Bye. And that's it. Yeah. And, and as the evaluator, the tester, what you're looking, what I'm, what I'm looking for is that mm -hmm. your dog doesn't try to drag you towards me or mm -hmm. away from me. Um, so it's not overexcited or afraid. Um, and it doesn't, yep. you know, jump all over me or all over you. It's not, you know, dragging you on a leash in any way. Mm -hmm. That's basically what I'm looking for. It's just kind of a somewhere middle of the road response of like, Oh, there's a person. Interesting. What do we do? You yep. know, Yep, exactly. So one of the ways that people work on this is 
when they, they they just start practicing approaching another person, they automatically just ask their dog to sit or teach an automatic sit that when I stop walking, you sit, right? Um, and the test doesn't specify that your dog has to be sitting or down or standing or anything. You can make those little modifications to set your dog up for success, which is And really it cool. also doesn't say that you can't give your dog a reminder. Right. So like, I know really cool. when I did this... Um, with one of my dogs, they actually, the dog did, my dog did know the evaluator. We, on a friend basis. Um, so it, it, the dog was very excited to see that person. So <laughs> as we walked up and, and the person excitedly said, hello, I said, hello, off <laughs> <laughs> to my dog. I said off to my dog. Cause that, that tells my dog, like, we're not going to approach. We're not going to jump on. We're not going to do anything crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. just keep, keep it chill. Yep. Exactly. And my dog did. They, they held it together. I was yeah. proud. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so the next uh, test item is test number two is uh, being able to accept petting. So sometimes evaluators will combine these two tests. I like to do it separately personally whenever I test a client or a person um, and their dog because I just, I, I think it's more fair and we've got plenty of time usually in the test. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the same kind of thing. Um, you ask your dog to sit, but it's okay if they stand up, they don't have to hold that sit. And it's the same thing. Like they, they don't, it's not like you're, the person's going to be like, Oh, who's a good boy or good girl. Right. It's, it's a very calm petting. Hi, may I pet your dog? Sure. And you go and you gently pet and the dog can't jump on you. The dog can't bark or growl or, or shy, shy away, away from me a hand. Yeah. Right. Which this part this this B town will never be CGC because right. of this. Right. Um yeah, I think I think he could nail almost every part, but yeah. this part for sure would be like a, a deal breaker. Right. Right. Exactly. He's gonna grumble or or kind of, you know, try to get some space of his own or something like that. Right. Yeah. Which I kinda wish there was like I mean, there is, I guess, a modified CGC test if you look at Jay's social responsibility test. Yes. Because his test is essentially um so this is Jay Jack um, with GRC Dog Sports, um, and I forgot what his like actual training company is called, um, but he basically has like a CGC test that's essentially um, more geared towards dogs who may not be like accepting of people and dogs, and that's okay as long as they still have good obedience, they don't overreact, um, and they can you know handle their shit within you know, reasonable parameters. So like he could be town could total, excuse me, totally pass that test. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, uh, the next test B town would also fail. So test number three is grooming. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the evaluator, it specifically says on the test, the evaluator um, needs to check their ears, their two front paws. It specifically says not back paws, front paws. Right. Um, and a brush. And like to lightly brush the dog, which I think yeah. is hilarious. That does not mean they're going to brush out mats on your dog and make it a super right. detailed process. They just present the brush. They let the dog sniff it usually. And then just like a few quick strokes, which I find hilarious because like both my dogs are very short hair. I've never once used a brush on them ever. <laughs> and other than to like weird them out or because they were curious about it or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I find it hilarious that like that's, that's part of the test, regardless of whether you have a velvet hippo or a German shirt haired pointer or yep. a big fluffy dog. <laughs> yep. Um, but usually it's pretty brief and like, regardless of whether, cause like somebody might think that that's not fair. Right. Because like, why would I ever put a brush around my super short haired dog? But having a novel item approach yeah. the dog is still valuable and is still something you should have worked on anyways. Like when a, uh, at the vet, for instance, when a dog um, has to have its eyes or ears checked, right. There's an instrument coming towards them, that sort of thing. And I've, I've definitely, you know, I'm sure you have too worked with dogs who are afraid of novel objects coming towards them. Um, mm -hmm. So it is a good desensitization thing to work on with your dog. It's just, kind of touching them with random objects that sounds yep. weird but um you know <laughs> you, you want the 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 point of it is so th to show that the dog understands you're not trying to harm it mm -hmm. you know um i think that's the point of it yep exactly yeah. oh we didn't talk about how to work on test two oh, or test okay. three so we'll kind of combine those two so um t for test number two which is petting 
right? So one of the things I often recommend to people when they have really excitable dogs who love meeting people, maybe you did too good of a job socializing your dog like Courtney did with Phoebe. Yeah. (laughs) Um, One of the things I always recommend is like go somewhere busy, like whether it's a park or you go to Home Depot and you kind of post up by the cash registers and you ask your dog to sit or lay down, whichever one they're better at. And essentially, um, you just let people pass and you keep reminding them to sit or down or whatever the command they're supposed to be in. And if people ask and they're a little too excited, like if they, if somebody says, Hey, can I come pet your dog? Um, if they're a little too excited, tell them not yet, come back in like five minutes. Um, because you, the dog is too excited. Right. (laughs) Or the person maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if the person's running up, like, Oh my God, is that a dog? I love dogs. (laughs) Ah, let me touch it. Yes, exactly. Like, so, um, either or, right. Or or your own comfort levels too. Maybe you're like, you just got in and you're a little overwhelmed and like, there's a lot going on. If you're feeling flustered and a little scatterbrained and stuff, it just say not yet, but we're working on it. So I would love it if you would come back because we are trying to work on this. We're just not ready yet. Um, I've done that so many times and like handful of times people do come back. They're like, are you ready for me now? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah come back. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, pe- strangers actually, for the most part um, that I've experienced, do like helping with the training. They, they don't yep. want to do it wrong. So a lot of times it starts off with an apology, like, sorry, sorry, sorry. Am I distracting? Sorry, I messed up your training. <laughs> and I you know, explain, no, actually, you're a good distraction. If you could just hang out right where you're at, that's great. So I can work with the dog right there. And they're like, yep. oh, okay. You know, yep. you gave them a job. So they, they usually get yep. excited. They're like, like this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Perfect. Kids yes. kids love that stuff too. Kids love that very specific direction yeah. and feeling like they're helping. Um there's I think it's it's more often than not I see kids uh much more excited to follow the rules I give them than than the adults. <laughs> the adults get offended because yeah. they're entitled. <laughs> yeah. Um but yeah, so um you don't basically the moral of the story is you don't have to rush to the end result, right? You don't have to be like, well, my dog's supposed to, the end result is my dog needs to stay in their sit or they're down and not jump on the person. So I'm going to just let people touch them over and over again until they stop doing it. But unfortunately that's not how dog brains work. Right. So it's much better to kind of ease them into it get them acclimated, prevent those problems from arising, prevent that over arousal of like (gasps) person, because if you can change their mindset from, Oh my God, a person is here for me. And then they immediately get rewarded to, Oh my God, people are here for me. Oh, they're not here for me. Okay. That's cool. Like, I'm just going to observe and we're doing this. Okay, cool. And you're, you're creating more focus back on you as well. Um, and you're letting the environment help you instead of hinder you. Yeah, you're you're aiming for the neutral response, that middle of the road, which yep. I mean, you got to bump up against some walls sometimes to find the middle. So yeah. <laughs> if your dog is near or nearer, closer to a wall than the middle, that's OK. Um, yeah. You need to you need to show the contrast and work on, you know, whatever it's going to take to get you closer to that middle. Speaking of walls, it's yes. also very helpful to kind of put your back up against an aisle or like at Home Depot, they always have stuff by the cash, cash registers in the middle of the aisle, which like displays and things like that. So if you can kind of position yourself to where you're not getting bombarded with people from all around 360, it's also going to help you be a lot more self-aware and spot those people who are like, oh, puppy! Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And kind of control and manage the situation better, that kind of thing. Now, if you have a hard time saying no to people, well, this is a good time to practice. This is a great time to practice. Um, You are not harming anybody but your dog's progress by not being able to say no, thank you. Right. It is always within your right. Like, I'm not going to let people touch my kid all willy nilly. Like, gross. Ew, go away. Ew. (laughs) <laughs> like no you may not get out of my kiss personal my space child <laughs> gross <laughs> i don't know you maybe <laughs> maybe that won't be as much of a problem these days because of the, the you know the whole pandemic situation but yeah um yeah who, who knows um grooming stuff honestly grooming stuff would be really easy to work on because that's something you can do yourself um, at home every day. You don't really necessarily need somebody else. If you have a spouse or something like that, or friends who don't mind coming over and kind of just proofing that 
just to make sure that they can do it. But like, don't let your friend walk in the door and then immediately go to, let me check your paws. Cause again, dog's not going to be in the right mindset for that. And it's really important that when you're practicing these skills, you have that dog in a neutral, calm mindset. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> Good add on. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm here for. Got the, the little plug uh, yep. commentary. Um, test number four. This one might be one of the biggest struggles for some people um, is loose leash walking. So um, there must be a right turn, a left turn, and a bout turn, which is basically where you just like do a 180 and you just start walking the other, other direction. Um, and then a halt. That's all it stipulates. So sometimes what uh, evaluators will do is they'll put some cones out and they'll say at this cone, turn left, this cone, turn right. I just kind of bark out orders because it's just easier. I might like set up <laughs> cones. So, and it's, it's kind of more fun for me <laughs> to do it that way. I'm like, okay, right turn, <laughs> you know? Um, but it just kind of depends. Um, and essentially the dog can't pull you, right? Um, this is not through a crowd yet. That's actually the next test. This is just you with your dog. That's and it. you can talk to your dog. You can talk to your dog. Yes. You can say, let's go. You can say, good boy. You can say any of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, we forgot to mention there are no tools allowed on this test. Or food. Or food. So that's a tool, right? Fair so, enough. Um, so no food, no pinch collar, no slip leash. It has to be either a flat collar or a martingale collar and a leash. And that's it. You get nothing else. Yep. So this is obviously going to be potentially a struggle for some people because you can't use a harness. You can't do any of that stuff. Um, <clears throat> so obviously the best way to practice that is to practice every single day on every single walk and make every walk count. Hire a trainer if you need help with like techniques or specific skill sets. And if you're struggling with loose leash walking, know that it's a process of learning yes. and it is difficult. I've heard, I've actually heard recently, like a lot of trainers start to say that loose leash walking can be one of the hardest things to teach. Yep. Um, and I actually understand why they're saying that um, because like a dog's natural gait is way faster than ours yes and and we i think as like a human race are slowing down even more <laughs> so like we just want to meander and stroll and you know look at our phone or listen to the breeze or whatever and the dog's like yeah 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 but like we got ground to cover so them walking at our pace is difficult for them to do mm-hmm Yep. And like, I've never docked points. If somebody like walks kind of fast, you can kind of tell the difference between when someone's walking fast to avoid tension on the leash versus they just naturally walk fast and they might be kind of, you know, inspired to walk quickly because of their dog. Um, but I've never really docked points for that either. Like it's whatever pace you choose, your dog should be at your pace. And like when you come to the halt, for instance, right, there can be a little quick, tiny bit of leash or whatever, but they should very, very quickly respond. And ideally in a perfect scenario, your dog stops exactly when you stop and there's no leash involved at all. But right. a little bit of tension for like a second is totally fine. Same thing with like the left turns and right turns. Um, I think and, as, as long as it can fall under the like umbrella yeah. of guidance. Yes. Um, and the dog responds to the uh, tension on the leash, then I think, I think it passes. Yep. Yeah. Um, you would get dog points if your dog's lollygagging a lot and like stopping to sniff a ton of stuff because the point is you should be walking together. Mm -hmm. So something to kind of keep in mind. Um, test number five is you do walk through a crowd, but this is only pedestrian traffic. So some evaluators will do a bunch of dogs like because you just use everybody in class. So it'll be yeah. like dogs and people. A lot of times people. there's like five or six or more people showing up for the same test. And yep. the evaluator will just combine not only exercises, but use you will use the other people participating. Yep, exactly. Um, but I've made it a point nowadays to just be like, everybody go tether your dogs. Mm -hmm. And there's one dog walking through a crowd because the, the test specifically says this should be pedestrian traffic. So I might let like one other dog walk around or something like right. that because I want it to be, yeah, you might part of pedestrian traffic includes a, a dog or, or a two dog potentially, or but every once in a while, yeah, there's a ratio usually. Yeah. It's not seven dogs. Right. 
Right. That's a party. That's different. Right. And that's very difficult. And, and the same rules apply, right? Like they can be interested. They can be curious as they pass somebody, but they can't lunge. They can't jump. They can't go, ah, they can't bark. They can't have a, basically an overreaction of either direction, either fearful or excited. Um, so best way to do that is take your dog for walks, right? Yep. Practice that pedestrian environment, but also you can totally like get together with some friends at a park and have them like mingle in an erratic circle. Group classes are really great for this too, because a lot of times there's like pedestrian type activities, that kind of stuff. So this one, you will have to seek some more help <laughs> to yes. work on. You can't just do it by yourself, but that doesn't mean that you still can't present distractions. So one thing that, that I've done to sort of halfway prepare is you put a bunch of stuff on the ground. You have a toy, you have a cone, you have a little bag of treats, you have random novel items that your dog would potentially be interested in and you kind of weave around them and walk past them and that sort of thing. So it's not exactly the same thing, but it's a very similar skill set of, nope, we're walking together. So especially if your dog tends to stop and want to sniff and lollygag and that kind of thing, or be like, oh, what's that? And kind of pull to the left a little bit. You can work through that with a lower stationary distraction mm -hmm. before you add in some a moving target like a human walking past. Yeah. Moving distractions are always more challenging. Yes. Unless your dog is just like super toy motivated and doesn't True. care about people because then that True. toy might be harder, which would be great to work through because if you can work through that, then you can work through the the people stuff. You can um, dodge a wrench. You can dodge a ball. Yes, Sorry. exactly. <laughs> is that from dodgeball? Yeah, I watched it recently <laughs> and I've just been like nonstop quoting dodgeball. It's a problem. Uh, that's hilarious. Uh, test number six is sit down, stay. So. In this test, what it looks like is your dog will you you'll be asked to ask your dog to sit, then you ask your dog to lay down, right? And then as far as the stay goes, you get to choose whether you put your dog in a sit or a down. So if you know your dog sucks at staying in a down, you get to choose a sit. If you know your dog has a propensity to go from a sit to a down, even when you don't tell them to, you should use down put for this. Down. You can they, remind them. They have them. to stay in the one you put them in. Yes. So if they get up or lay down or change position in some way, that disqualifies them. Um, so you choose which one you want to leave them. And let's say we selected down. Um, you can say stay or wait. You can't repeat yourself a bunch, but you can say that. And then you turn around and you walk away 20 feet. At this point, the instructor will have given you a 20 foot long line for that. I believe it's yeah, 20 feet. Um, and that's it. That's all you have to do. Usually they'll tell you to go back and, you know, pet your dog, release them. Or what they'll do is they'll usually what most people do is they'll combine it with test seven, which is come when called. So since you're already 20 feet away from your dog, technically for the come when called thing, it's only 10 feet away, which is really short, honestly, yeah. <laughs> like that's nothing at all. Um, so, but since your dog's already in a down or sit stay or whatever, um, we'll just combine that and you tell your dog come. So when your dog comes to you, they don't have to sit. They don't have to like do anything specific. They just have to come towards you. Um, uh, obviously they can't just be like me or do a drive by or right. whatever, but it doesn't matter if they jump on you when they get to you. None of that stuff matters. There's no stipulations. Again, every evaluator might be a little bit nitpicky about certain things. Um, so definitely make sure you go and like read through the specific rule sets, because like if you do, if you're like, dude, I didn't pass, I got disqualified on this, but the rules don't specifically say the dog can't jump. You can always dispute that. And it's only 25 bucks to take the test. So it's not like taking it again would be like a major deal. Um, but like if you worked hard and you know that you technically should have passed, like you can fight for that essentially. Yeah. Um, and by the way, you can go to the CGC or AKC website to look up a list of evaluators. Um, some trainers will have that on their website, or you can just call them and be like, hey, do you do you do CGC testing or anybody who know anybody who does? So um, it's pretty much like once you're a trainer, you can just be like, I'd like to do this, please. And then they send you a pack. They send us a packet of stuff and then we can we can test it. So. Um, I don't think I've ever seen anybody charge an extra fee. Have you? We just charge the AKC processing fee, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Cool. Um, because <laughs> it's kind of free marketing for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so ways you can practice this. This is pretty easy because, like, if you can get your dog to sit down, stay, or recall around high distractions you're going to be able to do it during this test because there's not going to be dogs milling around. There's not somebody playing fetch over at the park, you know, at the other side of the park, there's, you can practice sitting down stays in your living room and like walking away and coming back, that kind of stuff. And just be really nitpicky about it. Right. Just because you walked back doesn't mean your dog pops up. Right. When they're sitting or they're down um, and start small. Right. Don't be like, cool. The goal is 20 feet, so I'm going to walk 10 feet away. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Start by just turning your back or taking one step backwards, right? And then go back and reward and release or whatever. Like, yeah, make build it up very successful repetitions yes. um, under what is challenging to your dog. Yep, exactly. Um, I think there's like an 80 30 ratio or something like that. I, I've I heard a ratio somewhere at some point and I was like, that ratio makes sense because uh, you want like most of it to be easy, yeah. um, but then like a small percentage yeah. of it to be challenging. Right. So you don't want to make it all super challenging because then the dog's not going to feel like they can be successful. Right. And then because you're not a dog trainer, you're probably going to end up marking the wrong thing. Yep. Yep. So. Or just being like, that was good enough. Right. Yeah. And keep sessions, remember, like, especially for stuff like this, when you're doing like stay and stuff, keep sessions short. There's no need to do like 30 repetitions in one sitting. Like nope. do like th three to five, 10 tops. Like yeah. you don't really need to do a ton. And, and in fact, it's better. Life. It's better. Like how much, how much easier does that sound to like incorporate in your daily life to just be like, cool, I'm going to do five reps real quick. Real That's quick. so much easier. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then if you kind of keep it in your mind, like I'm only going to do like three to five ish reps. Well, then, you know, like you're not going to overdo it and go too far and push the dog until they're failing. And now you're just confused and frustrated. And the dog's like, I do. I keep getting food. OK. And then you confuse them and make it harder on yourself the next time. Yeah. So keep it short and sweet. Um, <laughs> recall drills. There's tons of stuff on YouTube that you can look up. Obviously, um, it's pretty straightforward in your house to just be like, okay, now you've worked on your sit or your downstay to just walk away and tell them come. There's lots of games you can play. Obviously, you can hire a trainer. What's your favorite recall game? Um, so my I have two favorites. Number one, hide and go seek recall. Yeah. So you like have somebody hold the leash of the dog if they're not very good at their stays yet. Um, and you go out of sight, usually just like around the corner. Um, and then you call your dog and tell them come and they get really, really excited. And I love that mindset of like, oh, where'd you go? But also as y'all get better at the game, you can make it harder by like hiding behind curtains and underneath blankets on the couch. And like my favorite is like, you know, when you open a door and it like becomes parallel with the wall hiding behind the door because mm -hmm. so many dogs will come and like sniff your feet and then be like, no, it's not them. And then just like move on. <laughs> and it's hilarious. <laughs> it's so hard not to laugh. Um, and then the other one is paper plate recall and paper plate recall. There's tons of YouTube videos for it out there as well. Um, it was invented by Dick Russell. It's a really cool game because it it works on sending your dog away to a paper plate that's got treats on it. And then as soon as they're done, you call them back to you um, and you give them some treats. So nice. it's really, really, it's motivation for them to go away, but also to come right back to you, essentially. Well, do yes. you have, do you have favorite recall games? Uh, I really like restrained recall. Um, which is similar to the hide and seek, except you don't go out of sight. Um, it is a two person thing where one person mm. holds the dog back and the other person mm. like backs away from the dog and you're kind of, you know, clapping your hands, saying cute stuff. You're not saying, you're not saying the recall word, but you're saying basically everything but it. And yeah. you're backing away from the dog and you're getting them super amped up. And um, the dog's supposed to get frustrated because it wants to get to you. Yeah. And then you say your recall word and that cues the person holding the dog to let, to go, let go. And now the dog gets to come to you. And so like, it's kind of uh, a lot of my clients have been like, that's reverse psychology. And I'm like, yeah, maybe it is, yes. but it gets the dog to want to get to come to you um, instead of having to come to yeah. you. Yeah, that hide and seek uh, kind of has the same effect. Yeah. 
Yeah. I totally forgot about restrained recall. That's awesome. I'm going to have to start using that again. It's I used fun. to do it all the time. Um, yeah, that's super fun. It, mindset, right? Mindset is so important for anything that we do with our dogs of like, we want them in the correct mindset when they do certain things, because if you're in the right mindset, anything else is easy. Mm-hmm. I, I could go start talking about my birthing classes that I've been taking. Because <laughs> seriously, that's that's yeah. like what it is. It's the pain is going to exist no matter what, whether I get an epidural or not. It's the the m- mental the aspect. Pain's of the in emotional. the brain. Yeah. And how you choose to perceive it. Right. So if we can get our dogs to be like, no, screw you. I want to go there. Whenever yeah. they hear the word come, that's way better than them being like, uh, that means yeah, I can't have fun I'm, anymore. You know, Mm Because recall, a lot of times, um, we, I'm saying we because I have messed up a dog like this, (laughs) um, only call our dogs to us when fun time is over or Mm -hmm. when something bad's going to happen. Like, I'm going to give you a bath or, you know, pull something out of your foot or whatever. Um, So, yeah, making it a a good reason to come to you, not a Mm -hmm. uh, fucking parents, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, cool. So um, there's only three more tests. So number eight is reaction to a dog. Um, and this is not interaction with a dog. This is very similar to the very first test where you greet a friendly stranger, where you you and another person with a dog walk up to each other. You both have to have your dog sit. Um you guys, so before COVID, you would exchange a handshake. Now it's probably just like a wave or an, an air five or something yeah. like that. But you're supposed to be kind of within handshake high five range. Um, like six feet. But now it's probably going to be more like six feet, which yeah. honestly will help you a lot. Um, but your dog has to stay in their sit. They can't be reactive in any way, whether it's like, oh, doggy friend or Hey, screw you. There's a dog. They can't be afraid. They can't be alarmed. You and that person exchange pleasantries and then you go, well, see you later. And you turn around and you walk away or you pass each other. Again, you can talk to your dog. Yes. And they don't have to be like a statue, right? They can wag their tail. They can wiggle. They can air sniff. You know, they can they can have uh, natural dog responses, um, Mm -hmm. but they need what you're trying to show is that you can tell the dog not right now. We're not going to play with this dog right now. Or we're not going to eat this dog right now. Or we're not going to run from this dog right now. Whatever it is you need to tell your dog, Mm -hmm. you can tell them we're not going to do that right now. Yep. And your dog go, okay. Yep. Exactly. Um, One of the best ways to work on this uh, is obviously get a friend who you can practice those approaches with, right? Get a trainer, get a friend, right? Whether you got to pay for your friend or whatever. (laughs) Um, But also if there is a like trail or something like a, a, or a a popular area, like in your neighborhood where people walk their dogs all the time. And there's like a little bit of a field next to it, right? You can practice those approaching that trail or that pathway from a perpendicular angle and having your dog sit, 20 feet away, 10 feet away, five feet away, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. and practicing those thresholds. And even though that dog is walking perpendicularly across your path instead of head on, that's still really valuable because the novelty of that dog, the energy of that dog, and you know your dog best. So if you know, if you see that person getting dragged by their like doodle puppy and they're just like, ah, (laughs) <laughs> and just kind of going wherever it wants to go and <laughs> weaving all over the place. Well, then, you know, like maybe I should stay further back. Right. Cause that's not going to set my dog up for success. Um, but if it's just somebody like jogging and they're focused or they're just walking, doing their thing, right. That kind of thing. Like y- you can go a little bit closer to them. Right. But also pay attention to where your dog's at in that moment. Right. Like usually when you first start, your dog's going to be a little bit more excited or interested or mm-hmm. nervous, right. Whatever, whatever their, their thing may be. Um, what, do you have any other tips for that, for how you can work on that besides get a friend and use the trails? <laughs> I mean, yeah, if you, if you don't have a friend, like, like Misha was saying, just create space out in the world from, you know, around dogs you do see, go practice outside of a dog park, you're like 30 feet mm-hmm. from the entrance so that's a good and, one. and just have the conversation, whatever it needs to be with your dog of wait, we're not going to go up to that dog. Yep. And, so, and start that and see how your dog responds to that. If your dog pretty easily is like, oh, okay. Yep. And and it's not a big deal, then work your way closer. Um, it, it really depends on the dog, though, mm-hmm. on how to work on it. Because mm-hmm. there's so many ways that it can go 
not and, like I just described. Right. And just other factors, right, with, yeah. within your dog. Like if your dog can't even hold a sit at home, well, there's not distraction. Right. Then, then we have to start way other places. Yeah, exactly. But, but I, I mean, I imagine you got you, you guys, you, you people listening um, <laughs> are starting to see that a lot of these like are like what you would expect a good canine mm -hmm. citizen to do. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's and they all kind of overlap and they all kind of have the same general theme is that you as the dog's human can communicate with them. When is the appropriate time and place to do whatever we're going to do? Yep. Exactly. Um, test number nine reaction to a distraction. So that can be a door slamming, a clipboard being dropped, somebody pulling out some crutches or a walker or a wheelchair, some kind of like, you know, medical apparatus, if you will. Mm -hmm. I once used a bullhorn, you know, those like little things that you talk through that amplifies your voice, but they also have little alarms on them. And I use the alarm on that. And of course, <laughs> of course I asked, does anybody have a problem with me using the alarm? Nobody said anything. And then one of the dogs panicked and then the person got really upset with me because apparently their dog was in a fire. And so it was very Aww. traumatizing. But I was like, but I asked if it was okay to use the alarm sound and you, you didn't, didn't say mention anything. anything about that. Right. Uh. So, it's, and I wait, like I waited. It wasn't just like, can I do this? Boop. No, it was like, does anybody have a problem with me using the alarm as the noise? No. Yes. No. No. Okay, cool. Boop. And the person got really upset and yelled at my, my boss on my behalf. And my boss Aww. was like, sorry. It's a fucking test. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, so definitely advocate for your dog for sure. I felt terrible because yeah. I didn't know. I tried yeah. to know, but you know, whatever. Um, so that one's really easy to practice because loud noises are easy to recreate. It's usually some kind of loud noise. The easiest thing is somebody dropping something. Right. And again, they have to be, they can be like, Oh, what was that? Ugh. You know, like you can get a little startled. You just can't be like, ah! <laughs> you know, right. They, they want to see that they don't go into a flight or fight state of mind. Yes, exactly. All right. And last one is supervised separation. Um, this one, they'll usually, if it was just one dog that's being tested, the person doing the test will, will just be like, can I take your dog, hold the leash, and the person leaves the room or go sits in their car for three minutes. Three minutes is a really long time, by the way. It feels it like It really forever. is, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, it's basically the dog can be like, oh, where'd they go? But again, can't panic, can't whine a bunch, can't bark a bunch, right? Just basically doesn't have separation anxiety, right? Yeah, it has to be um, a, a neutral response. Yep. And so, again, you can start this. It d Depending on how what your dog's current response is, is going to really vary how you work on this. So this one, I would probably say, like, talk to a trainer. Because, like, if your dog has a very severe response, I wouldn't necessarily start with just one minute. I might. Right. I might start with 30 seconds. I might start, I with, might start with 10 seconds. seconds, depending on how severe the response is, because I've right. seen some pretty severe responses to the trainer go, or the handler going out of yeah. sight. But I might also start with 10 minutes. And right. let, like if I know and that dog, dog cycle through it. Yeah. If I know that dog can cycle because they've told me the dog can cycle, I'm going to start higher and work my way back down. So that way they I just start shortening how long that dog takes to cycle essentially. Mm -hmm. So it really, really varies a lot. It really depends on your situation. Um, if you have the type of dog who just barks for like three hours straight, when you leave, <laughs> you need to hire a trainer first of all, to work through that. And yeah. it's going to be much more than just working on it for the CGC test. Right. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, usually the easiest way to practice this in your house is tether them in another room. Right. Or just, or in the same the room. Yep. If you have a dog that's constantly touching you in your house yeah, uh, and they're not good at this part of yeah. the test, like tether them in the same room, yep. have them be six feet away from you while you do dishes yeah. or you do whatever. So, yep. Start there. And that's it. Those are the 10 test items for CGC. Yeah. That's not, not bad. Not huh? bad. Yeah. Not bad at all. So there is also, if you're like, Psh, my dog can do that. Right. So mm -hmm. it, once you take that test, there are other tests. CGC mm -hmm. test you could take. Um, There's an urban one, mm -hmm. which is somehow a lot easier. Like 
and even less specific with like, there's some of the same elements like grading a stranger and whatever. And some of that stuff is in there, but it's, there's there. They don't really care if your dog jumps on that one. And it was just bizarre. Like it's super weird, but I guess the idea is you're out in public. And so that makes it intrinsically harder. I don't know. Okay. And I think they have a third one now too. Don't uh, they? There's a CGC a, which is advanced. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's we're not going to go through all those test items. No, there (laughs) there is more. Um, And then, like we talked about, there is the JJAC SR test. If if you have a dog like B-Town who it's like, okay, well, he he's probably never going to pass a few parts of that for whatever reason. Like that's Mm -hmm. that. And that's okay. That is okay. There's there's other goals you can have um, for you and your dog and not push those buttons that that don't really need to be pushed. You know, Uh, it's not helping the relationship for you to. Nope. shove a treat in your dog's mouth every time someone touches it like there is a place for that but there's also a some dog called the vet <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh yeah that's not all the time in every place so uh if you've been trying something like that with your dog and you're like this isn't fucking working um there's other there's other yeah. things there's other ways to to live life with your dog they don't have to get over that yep exactly Well, we hope you all enjoyed this episode and learned something. Um, Maybe you have some new goals that you can work towards. Um, Definitely go check out the CGC or the AKC's website on CGC stuff. If you're interested for more, you're also more than welcome to email us or message us on Patreon. Um, And uh, Also, I'm pretty sure a lot of the AKC tests can be done via internet now. Like oh yeah. Zoom videos and stuff. Uh, So I'm an evaluator. If anybody is like, I got this, like, Reach out to me. I'll test you. I'm an evaluator too, but I'm about to go on maternity leave. So leave me alone. (laughs) (laughs) That's why I didn't volunteer you. I was like, I don't, I don't know when Misha's going to crawl into a hole again. So I'm still tech. I'm still technically taking clients, but I'm also like transitioning them out and I'm being really, really selective on who I take. Nice. Like if there's like a really like, Ooh, this is going to take like a couple of months to solve. I'm like, I'm just referring them out because I don't want to have that. Don't have a couple of months. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Popping that thing out anytime. Anyway, we're done. We're wrapping up. Sorry, moving on to the Patreon episode. If you want more of us, that's where we are. Go to Patreon. Bye. Love y'all. Bye. <laughs> I almost clicked <like> to leave. <laughs>